Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Jessica Wright, and in today's Tools for Perseverance, we're going to be talking about understanding generations and the different generations in the United States right now um, and their perspectives on a lot of things. So this is a three-part series. This is part one, um, and we're going to be talking about what makes a generation. What is it that causes a generation to be what it is? Um, and then we'll talk about how generations work differently. Um, so what is their perspective on work and having a job? And then we're gonna talk about how do generations live differently? So what are their outlooks on life and how does that change by generation? Um, so first we'll start with what makes a generation. Um, this idea, this, this all, and all of these uh, concepts are coming from the field of industrial organizational psychology. Um, where we have studied generations and the differences between the generations to better understand how to make uh, you know organizations function better um, and make societies function better. And so when we think about what is it that defines a generation, normally generations, the, the years that bookend a generation, it's about a 20 year period um, that individuals uh, are, are a part of and you'll see we're going to talk a lot about the youth of a generation. So the first 20 years of an individual's life have a really profound influence on their brain development. Um, so if you learn, you know, anyone who's um, looked at some of the, the research on neurology of language development or in, um, you know, the brain development of, of children um, knows that if a child learns something early on, um, it is sort of programmed in a way that's different than if they learn it later in life. So for example, if I learn a language before the age of five, and then I um, you know, speak that language for the rest of my life, I can speak it without an accent. But if I learn a language after a certain age, I will always have an accent in my second language. And so the experiences of youth and what happens when we are young they shape us in a way that um, the later experiences of our life do not. And so that is really key and a key component that we're going to consider when we think about each of the five generations that exist in the workforce today. What is it that we know about their young experience, about what it was like to be a teenager, um, to be a child, to be a teenager, to be an early working adult, so someone just entering the workforce? Right, um, and understanding the differences between what happened in the 80s versus what happened in the 70s versus what happened in the 90s, um, and, and understanding culturally and collectively in the United States how each of the generations is different um, helps us to get a good idea of how the adults from that generation will then view um, collectively, right, um, different scenarios and different events. And all of this is really important as we look at what's happening um, in our nation, what's happening um, in the social upheaval that's happening in our country, as well as um, as well as what's happening with the virus and how we're responding socially and politically um, to the virus. And so, getting an understanding of differences um, between generations is really helpful to understand um, and create dialogue um, between those of us that have differences. So, what is it that makes a generation? So what shapes a young generation is typically um, two, two big things, war and technology. But I've added the idea of global events um, because we are in the midst of a global pandemic. And this pandemic will be shaping not only the one the generation that we're going to talk about now, but also the generation that follows. So um, the, the generation that we're going to talk about uh, that is around 20 years old now is called Generation Edge. Um, and so we'll talk about how this event is impacting them, but it will also be something that shapes the coming generation. Um, so war is something that shapes a generation. It, it helps them um, change their perspective on what safety and security looks like. It helps them get an understanding of what to expect in the future. Um, war uh, is something that really it does a lot to change the perspective of the individuals for life, uh, especially if they experience that um, trauma as a child. And um, so war and global events make a big um, shift for each generation. Technology changes, and specifically technology around communication. Um, just as the advent of 
Um, the cars becoming more accessible through Ford's assembly line enabled cities to grow beyond just the inner city, but to sprawl out into suburbs in a wider um, perspective. If you have a car, for example, um, you if one day you didn't have a car, maybe your only friends are going to live very close to you because you'll be able to ride a horse to them or you'll be able to walk to them. Um, but if you have a car, you can have friends and social relationships and working relationships with people that are further away and the same way that um, the telephone made it possible to have regular communication with people um, that were further away in the same way that um, technology computers uh, the internet has radically changed how we engage with people um, so that we're engaging with humans on a global scale on a daily basis now um, and all of that technology changes things so if it's 1994 um, and you are going to meet up with a friend, you might have a telephone conversation ahead of time and say, we're going to meet up at this time at this spot. Um, and you both agree and you hang up the phone. Well, when you get to this spot at this time, um, it's going to be really up to the person, right? And it's, there's a lot of trust in hoping and trusting that the other person's going to meet you at the time and place that you had decided because there aren't um, cell phones. Without cell phones, you have no way to check in or change plans or sort of make updates. Um, and so just as that changed between 1994 and say um, 2014, where uh, a young person would be going to meet up with a friend could easily check in. And if there were last minute changes to the plan, they could make adjustments as needed. And it's changed the way that we interact with each other in that way, the way that we trust each other. It's changed the way that we communicate. Um, and the expectations of the frequency of communications are radically different now, um, as well as the social environment. Um, so we'll talk through all that with each of the generations that's coming up. So when you're thinking of each generation that we'll be talking through over the next three sessions, really consider in what way was their childhood certain or uncertain. For example, someone who was a 12 or 13 year old in 1968 would have been living and growing up in and going in through adolescence at a time of extreme uncertainty um, where there were, you know, extreme violence, extreme um, uh, revolution, a, a time of um, pain and optimism at the same time. Um, and a lot of a lot of change, and all of that would have made um, a really unique mark on the brain development of the child, right? Versus someone who was growing up in a time of economic and relative social stability um, would have had a very different view um, because they had a sense of security and a sense of social stability that was um, that was that was quite different, right? And so then consider also what promises were made to the individuals from this generation when they were children, right, about what the future would look like. So if you were growing up and you were an adolescence in 1945 or an adolescence in 1955 or an adolescence in 1965, what promises are being made about what the future will look like and what's expected to them as an individual and understanding all of that helps to get a concrete sense of the level of expectation and the level of um uh, not the level up, but the, the type and the, the dynamics of the outlook of that particular generation because it helps us to understand where we each come from so each, there are five um, generations that are currently functioning in the workplace right now. First, the greatest generation uh, from 1930 to 1946. They um, are still in the workforce. There's about 1.5 million of them. And they normally act at this point as um, mentors or advisors um, because they are in um, the latter years of their life. And so they are there to provide expertise, um, normally in sort of mentorship or leadership positions. Baby boomers um, take up about 74 million um, uh, of our workforce, 74 million people in our workforce. Um, and we'll talk a lot about how the baby boomers shaped the current 
system of work, our current understanding of jobs, our current understanding of how work happens. Um, and then Generation X, oh, Generation X, 61 million people. Um, Generation X being the smaller of the generation, um, you'll talk about their unique perspective and how it's very different from either baby boomers or millennials. So um, millennials and baby boomers actually have an enormous amount in common, um, and that that's a lot of what we're going to talk through, um, is how similar they are, which is perhaps why there's so much conflict between the two groups. So um, from 1981 to 1996, roughly, uh, there are about 80 million millennials in the workforce right now. They are um, in their uh, 20s and early 30s. They uh, are, are making up a huge percentage of the workforce. And then we have Generation Edge, born anytime between 1997 and 2017, or if you want to think of it as between the year 2000 and 2020. Um, so these age ranges, different uh, groups of scientists have tried to figure out where the boundaries are between each of the generation. And um, the reality is those boundaries are uh, not definitively clear, um, except that uh, they are what we make of them. So Generation Edge, it's possible millennials last all the way up into 2000, and Generation Edge doesn't start until someone born in 2000. Um, and the same thing with uh, Generation X. Um, a, a lot of times these boundaries between where Generation X ends and will, where millennials begin have to do with these I, these big um, concepts that we talked about, right? These big concepts of war, global events, technology, or a big change in the social environment. So when we think of Generation X to millennials, a big part of the change is going to be their access to technology. Did they have a childhood with computers at home? Did they have a childhood with cell phones? Did they have a, child, did they have a childhood um, with these different bits of technology, and that would define a millennial versus define a Generation X. So when we talk over the next couple of days, we're going to talk through what is the different generations, what is their outlook on work, what motivates them, and what do they think of feedback. And those three questions are going to help us, and uh, those together will be in one session, and that will be um, how we think of, uh, you know, how each generation thinks about work. And then in the last video, we're going to have three questions we ask. How do they view authority? What do they most want to hear? And how is respect earned? And that's going to help give us an idea about their outlook on life. Um, so the first three questions are going to be really more about work, and the last three questions are going to be more about life. Um, I look forward to going through all of that with you, um, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.